Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Barnholtz Sloan. She uh, completed her undergraduate education at the University of Florida with a BS in mathematics. She then went to the University of Texas where she received a master's degree in statistics as well as her doctorate in biostatistics and statistical genetics from the School of Public Health. She has held numerous academic positions at multiple institutions and departments. Currently, she is a tenure professor in the Division of General Medical Services or Sciences, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, Center for Proteomic and Bioinformatics, and Department of Neurological Surgery at Case Western. She is also the Sally S. Morley Designated Professor in Brain Tumor Research and Associate Director for Bioinformatics and Translational <laughs> Informatics. Dr. Barnholtz Sloan's research focuses on the genetic and molecular epidemiology of brain tumors. She has had success with multiple multidisciplinary research projects, including the Ohio Brain Tumor Study, the Central Brain Tumor Registry for the United States, and gliogene studies. In addition, she is responsible for managing bioinformatics analysis of high-throughput omics data and implementing and maintaining a translational informatics solution for research. Overall, she's had extensive experience in hypothesis development, study design, and statistical analysis of all types of high-throughput data and clinical outcomes. Throughout her career, Dr. Barnholt Sloan has hit, had received many honors and recognition for her work. She has had over 220 peer-reviewed publications and has received multiple sources for funding of her work. She also serves as an editor or associate editor for multiple peer-reviewed journals. Please join me in welcoming her to our grand round. I'm not following instructions. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. So I want to um, thank you, Charlie, for the very nice introduction. And thanks to Dr. Salata for inviting me to come talk to you today. Um, so, and Dr. Armitage. So I'm going to talk to you today probably about a topic that is not a typical Grand Rounds topic for you, but hopefully you'll find something new in it that excites you. Um, really want to give you a broad scope of data sets that are available to you um, where we can provide some assistance for, for analytics um, to help you with furthering your academic career and asking some of the important questions that um, you think about every day as practicing clinicians. So data comes from everywhere, right? I mean, every day you're reading about, um, probably about data breaches, right? But the reality is, is that data is collected every millisecond, and there's more data collected than we know what to do with. But it really leads to multiple different types of potential research opportunities, especially when you think about using hospital-based data and data about the population of the Cleveland metro area. And some such examples could be cost effectiveness of a certain um, procedure or um, series of medicines that you give, patterns of care for a particular diagnosis, um, trends looking at incident survival, mortality, and prevalence. And then there are also things that we can do with big data that allow us to do operations enhancement and quality assessment. So some data sets are disease focused and others are not. I'm going to apologize up front, I'm a cancer person, so there's a section in here about some cancer databases, um, but there are other databases I'm gonna to describe to you and maybe for those of you that haven't thought about your disease of interest in the context of cancer, it'll spur some, some new idea. So the Institute for Computational Biology is a jointly funded effort between University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, and Case Western Reserve University really about using big data to help improve um, healthcare in the Cleveland metro area. We have uh, multiple pillars that we're working towards. Um, two things I think would be, uh, three things would be of direct interest to you. One is we have uh, computational services available for a fee for service if you need help with uh, data analysis or planning of a study. The second is, um, that we have uh, educational programs that we're starting. So we um, are launching a certificate program in clinical informatics. So for those of you that are interested in big data, bless you, Keith, being um, MDs is really critical if you have an interest in this. You guys know so much, and there are so many interesting ways that you would be able to use your knowledge as MDs to, to use the data that we have. Um, we will be starting a master's program and a PhD program. We're still in the process of getting those approved. And the third is access to some of these big data sets, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
So just some examples of big data, right? Everybody knows that, like, everything you're doing on your phone, someone's looking at those data, right? That's why things pop up on your phone and say, hey, what do you think about blankety-blank, right? So all of these companies, these are just a few examples, are using data that they collect on everything that you're doing and everything that everyone else is doing and doing predictions to try to see if they can predict how you're going to use their tool next. So how can we think about trying to do that with healthcare data, okay? So when you talk about biomedical big data, you talk about the four Vs, so volume, how much do you have, velocity, how fast is it coming, variety, how different is it? Um, even within the EHR, there's a lot of variety, right? Um, and then veracity, how good is it? A lot of people talk about EHR data not being good, um, I think that we have to qualify that a little bit, right? So EHRs are set up for patient care and billing, right? They're not set up for research. But there are ways that we can take those data and massage them and standardize them to make them useful for research, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing in the Institute for Computational Biology. With, specifically, we'll talk about what we're doing right now as we speak with the EMR data from university hospitals. So I'm going to talk first about the Clear Path project, which is our um, cross-Cleveland EMR-based project. Talk about how we're assembling it and how maybe you could think about using it. Talk about some other data sources um, available at the university. Um, talk about some cancer-specific databases, other types of databases, and then how can you get help. Um, I should say I'm very happy for any of you guys to email me. I have the last name from hell. Thank you to my husband who wanted me to hyphenate it. And um, so I'm very easy to find. I do have a UH email as well as a case email. And I'm a little more obsessive compulsive than I should be about the email. So please email me if you um, want to sit down and chat. Okay, I'm happy to meet. Okay, so the ClearPath EMR project. ClearPath stands for Cleveland Area Research Platform for Advancing Translational Healthcare. So bottom line, here's what we're doing. Um, it's taking the EMR data and standardizing it and making it useful for research. And the goal is to have it available in such a way that you're not going to have to wait around for someone to pull data for you. You are going to go through a process and you're going to have your chair sign a piece of paper that says you're a legitimate person in the department. And you're going to show us that you've done your human subject certification and a security sort of thing, which you need to be have to be on clinical protocols anyway, and we're going to give you access to the system. And there's going to be an interface where you're going to be able to click on variables of interest, and you're going to be able to search for potential cohorts of patients. If you're, um, you know, an industry, um, a pharmaceutical company comes to you and says, Dr. Smith, um, I'm really interested, you take care of this particular set of patients. How many of these patients do you have if we wanted to open our study at your site? Um, you're interested to know, okay, the national guidelines now say that for this particular diagnosis, this is what the standard of care is. For those patients that we have who are getting standard of care, what do their outcomes look like? How can we compare that to national standards? And for those patients that aren't getting standard of care, why not? What else is happening with those patients? why they're not getting standard of care, just as a few examples, okay? And so um, the idea of ClearPath, the, okay, so just a few principles is the, um, the fully identified data never leaves the hospital. So with the ClearPath UH data, you would have access by end of April, we hope, um, to the data here that's behind the hospital firewall it's all of the ambulatory and outpatient EMR data um, from all scripts for the last three years. Okay, so it's not a long, really long period of time, but it's good enough that I think there'll be some good stuff there. Um, and you could get access to it and use some of these tools to search and sort of ask questions and do some, I would say, more cohort discovery and hypothesis generation, okay? You would also be able to actually download or get access to a data set once you've identified a cohort of patients, and then if you needed 
analytical help, we would be available to help you. Um, and those data will have to currently be worked on behind the UH firewall. But the overall idea of ClearPath is we're going to do this standardization of data also with the metro data, metro health data, and with the Cleveland Clinic data. And eventually all three EMR data sets will be together. Okay? And in that data set that's all together from the three hospitals, it will not have identifiers on it. So the data behind the UH firewall will still have identifiers. But the identifiers will never leave the hospital. But they will have, there will be someone within the hospital who will be able to break the links for you and let you know who those patients are. Um, okay, so I'm happy for you guys to have my slides as well. So really this is a conceptual model. Um, and so the data comes from the different hospital sources and we make this essentially a very fancy ID for everybody um, that hopefully no one can break. And then for patients who have gotten care at multiple of the institutions in town, which we know happens frequently, um, they have this unique, very crazy looking identifier and we can actually put their records from the multiple hospitals together in a single record. Okay? And some of the external data sets that we can put in there are some of the census data sets about the population of the greater Cleveland area. There is Environmental Protection Agency information that's collected every like nanosecond about different particulates in the air, air quality, water quality, all kinds of things. So the person who's going to get the biggest prize is the person with the best idea, right? So start writing them down. Get your, seriously, just start writing them down, okay? You can tell I'm a little too excited. So what does this crazy ID look like? So what this crazy ID looks like, it's called a hash code, okay? So you can see here, these are example data, these are not real patients, that those are identifiers, right? That's a first name and a last name and a social security number and the elements of their date of birth. And that's what you use to create these crazy looking codes. Okay? And that's what somebody who's been anointed by the powers that be behind your firewall will have access to you to break those codes for you. So again, if you get approached by a drug company and they want to know how many patients do you have that fit these particular criteria, you could search for those patients. You could say we have 100 and then you would be able to go through the process with appropriate IRB approval to gain access to the identifiers for those patients and contact them. Okay, and why is this important for us to have these hash codes and to be able to what we call deduplicate? In other words, if Mr. Smith is seen at UH and at Metro and at Cleveland Clinic for a variety of things, we don't want to have three separate records in the database for him. We want to know it's him and we want to get all the data together. So these are data that come from a research network in Chicago that involves like eight or so hospitals, okay? And they use this hashing trick to get all their data together. And what it's telling you is um, just by the number of patients, and those are based on ICD-9 codes, I would suppose, for, and various other criteria for those diagnoses. Um, and you can see the number of patients if it's non-duplicated and then the percent reduction when they deduplicate across hospitals, okay? So for, for folks who have certain types of insurance, they can go wherever they want, right? Um, so I think it's really gonna be a powerful resource that I hope you'll be excited about. So how do we assemble ClearPath? So, you know, EHR interfaces all look different, right? These are just a couple examples of some different EHR interfaces. But EHR interfaces, the EHR again is, is meant for clinical care and for billing, for taking care of patients, right? So it doesn't have typically research analytics interfaces built in. And that's what we're trying to do with ClearPath is to create a way to use the data with an easy to use research interface so that you guys can ask the important questions. And one of the ways that we do that is by, so if we have EMR data from three hospitals, how do we get all of that together where it makes sense, right? And the approach that we're using is an approach that is used by the national VA system. It's used by multiple big 
um, healthcare agencies, by networks within, hospital networks within certain cities, um, and it's called a common data model. So it essentially, really what it is, is an accepted, well-defined framework for how you're gonna define diseases and procedure codes and test results and all of those sorts of things that you're collecting in the EMR. And why is this important, right? Because it provides a backbone for us to be able to build ClearPath and make it valuable. The other interesting thing is, so this is kind of what it looks like. So if you talk with John Shanahan in Research IT, who is our partner here at UH and has been fantastic, this is what he's going to show you is the scheme for the OMOF data model. And then if you ask him more questions, he's going to tell you, okay, you know, if I want these attributes, here's where I find them in the EMR. And he'll have different tables listed for where he finds them in the ambulatory EMR the inpatient versus the outpatient EMR, right? So, but why is this so important, right? Because it allows the ability to collaborate, um, not just across the hospitals in town so that we can better understand the patient population that you're serving and how it relates to the problems that are unique to Cleveland, the health problems that are unique to Cleveland, but it also would allow you to collaborate with lots of other networks across the world, okay? And it really allows for you to be able to use some of these easy to, interfit, easy to use tools for cohort identification, for patient level prediction, for population level studies, and for clinical characterization like cost effectiveness and patterns of care. So um, the OMOP common data model is built on what they call concepts, okay? And so what is a concept? Um, a concept would be something like um, atrial fibrillation, right? And what this is telling you here is the name of the, the variables within the model, because again, the model defines this set of variables, this backbone of variables, and then you have to know how to find it in your EMR. Now, one of the things that makes the EMR really challenging is that some of these things these definitions, these are in multiple different places in the EMR. So you also have to figure out where is the truth, okay? And that's why you have great IT people who know where these things are. So in this case, this concept is based on um, SNOMED codes, which is an accepted, you know, a vocabulary, medical vocabulary. And it's telling you that it um, has a, a certain code in SNOMED, and then it's looking for an interval of time where, where it would be valid to find that, okay? And then, um, but you can see here that you can also define the same concept using ICD-9 codes, right, on your upper left. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna use a combination of these two to create the appropriate definition of this um, condition. Okay, so this is just showing you just a snapshot, okay, of some of the places that are now using the OMOP common data model where they're taking all their data and mapping it to this same exact backbone. And maybe some of these places you guys know, could be excited about collaborating with, okay? I hope so. So, um, Here's another way to look at um, a, a comment, I mean, a, a concept, right? Um, mm -hmm. To just sort of think about it as, you know, these things change over time, right? And many of the questions that we want to ask are based on time, right? We want to follow the patients. We want to know what happens once they've been diagnosed with a condition, what happens over time, what drug did they get, what were their outcomes? And so this is just looking at um, the health encounter data. So how many patients are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation that were treated with Coumadin, okay? And what it's gonna do is it's gonna use a combination of the patient level data, the health system data, and the cost data to try to answer questions such as, how many had a stroke within a year after their AFib diagnosis? Or another such question, what's the relative cost of treating patients with Coumadin? Okay, so these are the types of questions, just giving you this as an example, and maybe this seems 
oversimplified. Um, but just an example of some really, I think, important questions that you could ask using this data set. Okay, so the tool that we're gonna be placing on top that will be really the, the workhorse tool is called Atlas. And it does all kinds of things. Um, mostly it, it's gonna do a cohort selection for you. So you'll be able to see all the, all the backbone variables of the, com of the common data model and you'll be able to pick and choose what your criteria are to pick your set of patients. And then it will allow you to actually do population level estimation and also patient level estimation. So how many folks keep hearing about machine learning? Oh, come on. I'm just gonna keep asking questions. Okay. Um, it's this math nerd thing I have going on. So. so machine learning is an extremely popular approach, right? Google and Amazon have been using it probably longer than anybody else, right? And what is it doing? It's taking information that they know about you and feeding it back into the system, and the system is learning, right? Okay, so you can use the same approaches with patients. So you can define a set of patients and you can say, this is my very, very strictly defined set of patients with a particular diagnosis, who received a particular drug, and this is what their course looked like. And then you can feed it back into the system. You can say, okay, I'm gonna loosen up my criteria. I'm gonna pick a bigger set of patients. How do they compare and what do their predictions look like? Okay, so let me just show you some examples of what I mean by patient level prediction. So if you think about this as a population of patients who received a drug, um, which patients will experience suicidal thoughts and behaviors a year after the start of the drug? Okay? And then can you use this data? If all patients are treated equally, um, then the average probability of the event for all patients is 3%. 3%, but can you personalize predictions to be more informative than just the population average, right? So we, when we talk about survival statistics, for example, we're all always quoting median survival statistics, right? That's really giving you an estimation of what it's like for the average person. But every patient wants to think of themselves as not the average person, right? So how can we make this more personal? How can we really use this data to make it more personal? So, um, if we think about these different outcomes of interest, and these are the population averages for, um, for how often those things occur in the average population, okay? And then we think about an 18-year-old female with a history of skin cancer and recurrent bouts of anxiety requiring psychotherapy, we can then look at those um, disease definitions again and we can create a individual level risk estimation for that patient based on her exact features about herself, about her disease course, okay? So these are the types of things that you're gonna be able to do with the data once they've been fully mapped to this backbone. And I think there's, you know, this is just an example and maybe some of these uh, disease definitions don't resonate with you. But, you know, if you just look at another example, 76-year-old male with liver disease, gout, diverticulitis, who was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, if you just look, just focus on the right-hand column, right, here's our young lady, here's our older guy. So the predictions change based on their individual level information. So these types of things could be useful not just to you who are taking care of patients, trying to figure out what's best for them and the way to go forward for them to help them, but also may be useful to the patients and their families. Okay, so let's just keep going. So, um, so there's lots of different things that you can do with the models. Um, I think there's all kinds of uh, additional data that we haven't even talked about that you could incorporate into these models. And the nice thing about the OMOP common data model is it's, a, it's an academic-based community. So if you are interested, you can join some of these working groups and you can actually contribute, um, which I think would be fantastic. I'm sure they would love to have 
more MDs involved. Um, okay. So um, here we are. And so we are going to be done with the mapping of the UH data, we hope end of April, beginning of May, um, which I think is very exciting. And we are moving forward pretty quickly with Metro Health as well. Um, clear Pass itself doesn't exist unless we have multiple hospitals data to go into it, okay? But that doesn't mean that you can't use the clear path light data behind the UH firewall, okay? And we're still working with um, Cleveland Clinic, but we have had um, initial discussions with SUMA and Akron Children's as well. So I think you can kind of think of this as growing into sort of a regional learning healthcare uh, data network, maybe if we want to call it that. Okay. So what about some other data sources at CASE? So, so that's the EMR-based stuff that we're doing in the Institute for Computational Biology. Hopefully I've gotten someone excited in the room about using it, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about it. So we do have a research core um, that's population health and outcomes. Um, here are the contact information and the link for the website. Um, and they can help with project design, database, and database access analysis, and with the IRBs. Um, they have access to very, very specific databases that some of you may be interested in. The first is the HCOOP data set, which includes the national inpatient sample, the California state inpatient sample, and um, I believe that they are in the process of updating these data sets to more recent years. Typically, national level databases like this are, when you get access to them, the data in them is at least a couple years behind the current year, okay? So I can tell you that we are in 2018, the National Cancer Registry data, the newest data set will be coming out will be up to 2016, so it's two years behind. So most of these data sets are like that, but has anyone heard of the National Inpatient Sample or used it? Okay, so it's a really rich resource. It's, um, it's admission from 20% of the hospitals in participating states, so it's millions and millions of folks um, with all their, it's not disease specific, it's disease agnostic, okay? But again, focus on inpatients. But I think that it's, um, you know, interesting to potentially look at that if you're interested in ED visits, readmission rates, you know, um, patterns of care that, that are more focused on inpatient care. They also have access to the health and retirement study and to Medicare data. Um, so the Health and Retirement Study is a longitudinal biannual survey. Um, it's, it's a representative sample of older adults in the United States. Um, it includes a lot of information, and it's linked with Medicare data. So um, it's, a, it's a very powerful data set as well. They have the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey, and then they also have Medicare and Medicaid data for the state. Okay? So... Um, you know, again, some of these data sets are going to be more appropriate to use for very specific populations, right? Medicare is typically for older adults or adults with certain disabilities, and Medicaid may be more focused on children or lower socioeconomic status. But it doesn't mean that you can't ask interesting and relevant questions. So how about some cancer-specific databases? You'll just bear with me while I tell you all this. Um, so the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program is the National Cancer Registry System. It's representative of about 26% of the United States. These data are very easy to get. You go on you, to the website, you sign an agreement, and you download the, the software and use it. Um, you can do incidence, survival, mortality, prevalence, um, and we regularly use these data, and, and it's very easy if you have an interesting question to get access and get a publication out pretty quickly. Um, there's also, these data are also have been linked to the Medicare data. Um, that's a little bit harder to get access to. You have to go through a formal application process and you have to pay to get access to those data. So just as an example, uh, I have a graduate student who has access to SEER Medicare data for brain and CNS metastases um, from breast, skin, and lung cancer. Um, we had to go three rounds with them before they approved the proposal, but I now have a very 
timely proposal that was approved, if someone wants to use it as an example, um, and it cost about $7,000 to get access to those data. Um, but I'll tell you a tool that you might be able to use to get money to pay for that if you're interested in using those data. The Cancer Genome Atlas Project was a massive project um, by the National Cancer Institute to do full molecular characterization of over 25 different forms of cancer. You can see there on your right the long list of data that um, was generated with this. And there's a very nice interface here called CBioPortal out of um, Sloan Kettering where it's very um, visual and graphic. Um, I think it's Best used to go this route if you have uh, questions that you want to ask, hypothesis generation, and then um, the data sets can actually be downloaded from TCGA and you can ask specific questions. But you go on and you pick what data set you want to look at, and then you can do queries, um, you can do survival analysis, you can do visualizations, comparing different genes to each other if you have a particular gene of interest, um, especially relevant if you're taking care of patients who have cancer and they're on targeted therapies and you know that those therapies hit a certain gene or a certain protein. Um, and then they also have this pretty cool thing called an oncoprint and you can download any of these and use them like in a paper or a grant application um, where what it's showing you across the top, these are for breast cancer patients, is HER2 status and their age. And then on the left, it's showing you um, whether or not they had a deletion or an amplification of certain genes and the frequency across the breast cancer population. The National Cancer Database is through the Commission on Cancer. Did anybody know that UH is a certified Commission on Cancer hospital? <laughs> okay, well now you know. Um, essentially what it means is that all hospitals are required by federal law to submit information to the state level cancer registry on all newly diagnosed cancer patients. You become cancer, commission on cancer certified because it means that you abide by certain standards for collection of those data, okay? But because we're a commission on cancer approved hospital, it means that you can get access to some of the commission on cancer databases. One such database is the National Cancer Database which is a, um, a sampling of all of the Commission on Cancer hospitals. So we just got approval for three separate data sets from this. Um, two of the approvals we received will be resident projects. Anybody a resident? Some of these databases are great for first author publications if you want to do them, okay? Um, we don't have to pay for these data, but we needed a letter from the higher ups at the hospital saying, yes, these people are legitimate. Um, and so we just got approval for three applications and there's two um, application deadlines per year. So there'll be another one coming in the fall. Again, we have successful applications. Happy to share them if you guys are interested. Some other things is there's an oncology database at Sideman and these are the types of data that are included in that and you can get access to that information if you are interested with appropriate IRB approval. Okay, so what other types of databases are out there, right? Um, and it's not a comprehensive list, but a beginning. So I think in this day and age where molecular features have come into play for lots of different diagnoses, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the national level databases that involve molecular data. And some of them are sort of all over the place. You can find all kinds of things. It really depends on what question you have. So dbGaP is the database of genotypes and phenotypes, and it was developed to be sort of a repository for studies that started with genome-wide association studies, okay? But they now have studies of the, all kinds of diseases, like every disease you could ever imagine, um, with sequencing data, with microarray data, with um, genome-wide so DNA-based, RNA-based, protein-based, all kinds of stuff there. And it's fairly straightforward to use. So this is what the interface looks like online, okay? And um, what you can do is you can um, go and just use the browser. Um, and if I search here, can you guys see this? If I can't see it, I need the glasses. Um, thank you, good thing I had LASIK, right? Yeah, 
Um, so if I just search for cardiovascular disease, okay, and I just filter by how many data sets are there. So it's, there's 188 data sets in there where somewhere in the description of that data set it says cardiovascular disease, okay? And some of them you'll see are huge, big data sets. Is anyone familiar with the NHLBI TopMed project? So this is a massive sequencing project for cardiovascular. Um, so this one is for risk factors in, in AFib and women, but the TopMed project is even larger than that where they're looking at all different types of um, cardiovascular disease things. <laughs> um, so uh, di different diagnoses related to, to the broader scope of cardiovascular disease, I should say. So what you do is you actually submit an application online um, where you propose what your hypotheses are and what your idea is and what your plans are. If you think you want to send an abstract to this meeting and you want to try to publish a paper in this journal, and then it goes through a pro an online process, and then hopefully you get approved, and then you go and download the data. And there's an annual renewal that has to do with that, okay? So pretty powerful, lots of stuff there. It's definitely worth spending, you know, 20, 30 minutes, if you have it, to go online and search for your favorite disease and see what's there, right? Um, the Gene Expression Omnibus is, is another big website that includes lots and lots and lots of molecular data um, from lots of different diseases, and there are also some normal Okay, data sets there. Um, sometimes the questions that we're asking require us to compare a data set on diseased individuals to normal individuals. And this started um, a long time ago, well before dbGaP did, and it really started with people putting like quantitative PCR, um, RNA-based data there, gene expression data. And then it moved to, now there's all sorts of data sets, gene expression arrays, um, sequencing data, proteomics data, um, all kinds of things. And both of these data sets, dbGaP and GEO, typically um, it's once the paper's been, as, as part of publishing the paper, they have to deposit the data there. And so you can find the published paper. And sometimes in the published paper you can find supplementary tables, which will give you additional patient information. But in my experience using both of these, if you contact the lead author on that publication, you say, I'd like to collaborate with you, and what other variables do you have? They're usually willing to collaborate. So you just have to spend some effort sort of doing some searches and figuring out for the questions you have what data sets would be appropriate. So this is what the Gene Expression Omnibus um, interface looks like. Um, and so if I search here for cardiovascular disease, you're going to see that there are 44,395 uh, data sets. Is that enough for anyone to start with? Okay. So if I try to just whittle that down, the one thing about GEO I should say that really is unique to dbGaP is dbGaP are all humans. Okay. All the data in dbGaP is human. In GEO, it's every potential animal you would ever want to see. So if I just go in and I say I only want to see entries that have data sets available for downloading, and I only want in humans, it gets me down to 136, okay? And so this is like some examples of data sets that were there. This is one, um, it's circulating blood from first time um, acute myocardial infarction patients within 48 hours of the, of the heart attack. Um, and you can see where the publication is. And then, you know, you don't really have to do anything here. You just go and download the data set. Now, you then have to know what questions you have and how to analyze it, right? So some of these data sources, there are additional steps and potentially money involved to get access to them, but some of them are just out there. And again, person with the best question wins. So how can you get help? Um, this is our sort of general uh, email for the Institute for Computational Biology. There's our website. You can find lots of information that we talked about related to the ClearPath project and other things within the Institute on that website. If you send an email there, someone's going to answer you. 
um, and try to help you. Um, one of the ways that I think you could potentially get money um, for analysis and for paying for data sets is through the CTSC pilot program. It's a one-page application. It requires you to have, you know, a rationale for your idea and aims, but I think they're fairly straightforward to get, and we've had multiple folks who have gotten them to gain access to data sets and analytical health. Okay, so again, have examples of those that have been successful and happy to share those with you. And you can look here to try to see um, what the rules are for those. And there's a great team uh, over at the Institute for Computational Biology. Um, the institute is led by Jonathan Haynes, who's also the department chair for population and quantitative health sciences. Our funding for the institute comes from the university, university hospitals and Cleveland Clinic. I can tell you that um, Dr. Simon would be thrilled if you guys have good ideas to use all these data, okay? Hopefully Dr. Salata too. All right, so I would, we would love to work with you. Please start writing down ideas. Please email me or send an email to this general email. Um, you guys are welcome to send my slides out. There's nothing in here that's, you know, proprietary. So please take another look. We've talked about a lot of stuff today. Um, and, and let me know. And I'm, I'm hoping to uh, talk with some of you soon. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's available to faculty and trainees. The trainees will have to have sign-off from their mentor, right? So, um, so there, are, there's, there will be an additional signature required to get access to the system if you're a trainee. Yeah. And we will be asking you some questions to at least give us a couple sentences about what you're interested in using the, the system for, right? Just so that we can um, have tracking appropriately, because we would, we would love to know if you're submitting an abstract to a meeting and if you're presenting it and how you're moving forward with publications. Um, would you be so kind as to put the, together a one pager about the capabilities and the contact information sure. and then we'll disseminate mm -hmm. that sure. to the department? And also in a condensed manner, we do have a leadership meeting on this. Okay. And we'll contact you if that's okay. Great. That would be fantastic. Just before I open things, so I um, I spend some time at VA, and I guess the VA federal it's not in the database. But the VA federal data is mapped to the common data model. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So one you know one one question I have, I, you know, based on my VA experience, is like is 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 um, uh, I guess validity of some elements. I'll give you an example, and some maybe some people work at VA. You can't discharge a patient from the ER without coming up with a diagnosis, and it's an ICD-10. And sometimes it's incredibly frustrating to find the right diagnosis. So you, you're, you're busy, it's hectic, and you kind of come up with a diagnosis with a patient that maybe isn't really what's going on, but you, it, lets you, it lets you finish. Allegedly, I have a friend who told me this. Um, <laughs> of course you do. So um, A close friend. Yeah. Yep. So just in terms of... <laughs> Variability probably evens itself out in big databases, right? I mean, it, but it, you know, just concerns about some of this, especially when it comes to doctors putting in diagnoses, that kind of thing. You know. I think well, I think that that, yeah. So you know, all of these, um, I would say, standardized diagnoses, yeah. code lists, yeah. have challenges, yeah, yeah. right? Um, that's why within the OMAP data model, like I was showing you, many times they're using two different coding systems at the same time to try to figure out whether or not that diagnosis is real. And then I think the bottom line is, is it just requires some time to figure out, you know, okay, you can start with searching for an ICD-10 code, but then what other factors, what other lab results, 
what are their potential procedures, what are their potential, um, let's say, comorbidities could be recorded in the record, um, you know, that could help you know whether or not that's legitimate or not, right? So it does require a little bit of effort to think through that. Um, I was remiss in um, having one other thing in the slide deck. I just didn't want to totally overwhelm everyone. But we do have, um, you know, so what's important to understand is that the, the elements from the EMR that are currently being mapped behind the UH firewall are the discrete elements in the EMR. What do I mean by that? You know, you pick on a drop-down drop down menu, how old are they, what's their gender, what's their ICD-10 code for, you know, for this procedure, this diagnosis, what's the date of service, what's the date of the procedure, what's the lab result. So those are the sorts of things that are currently being mapped. But that leaves a lot of information still in the EMR, right? You guys are spending a lot of time writing notes, the radiologist is writing notes, the pathologist is writing notes, um, et cetera. And so we have a, a collaboration with an MD clinical informatics person at University of Michigan who has a really slick tool um, that allows you to look at a certain word of interest and whatever synonyms for that word that you want or antonyms for that word, and it will search across all the notes for all the patients, and it will tell you for your cohort of patients that you're interested in where in the notes it's finding those words, okay? So to your question, Keith, that's going to help you better define your cohort, okay? And we will be, by the way, it's called Immerse, um, and we will be installing that. Once the data is mapped, we will be putting that behind the hospital firewall on the UH data. Yes. Yes. And this would be for all US patients or would this include So right now the data that's being that that is mapped is UH only for the entire health system, inpatient and outpatient, for the last three years. Okay? Um, we are in the process of getting the appropriate approvals in place to start mapping the metro data. You know, Metro has had EMR a very long time. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many years worth of the EMR we're going to be mapping. Um, they have some collaborations where they've mapped some of their data already to elements of, the, of this common data model, so we're just going to help them extend that. Um, the data all together doesn't exist per the agreements between the university and the hospitals unless all the data is ready to go in together. But if the data is mapped here, and it's mapped at Metro, we can help facilitate so you could run the same queries at both places and use the data sets together. Yeah. Any more, um, Hi, Anna. Yeah. yeah. If there's no other questions, um, Jack. Yeah, I was going to ask. Um, the, can you give some more details? Well, a couple things. One is uh, the, uh, the query goes for the application. The application for access goes through the Institute for Computational Biology. Okay. Yes. And, and I, uh, you started to talk about the potential collaboration. <coughs> you have investigators at Metro or the clinic. They can run, uh, working on the same project, Correct. they can run the data at their institution, and then we can run it here, right. and then potentially merge it. Right. That process is already in place. Can, 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 who does that? So the ultimate goal, okay, is that the data will be mapped to this common data model, so on this backbone, right, for UH, Cleveland Clinic, and Metro. And it will all be put together and the patients deduplicated. And then if you've signed the paperwork to get access to the system, you can go in and query it yourself, right? Now, exactly what time frame we're on to get all of that done, you can imagine, okay. So that said, I think within the next two to three months, you're going to be able to get access to the UH data and ask questions. Probably within the next six to nine months, 
the metro data will be mapped. And if you have a metro collaborator, we can help facilitate. If you ran a query on the UH data yourself and you wanted to run the same query at metro, we could get that done. The Cleveland Clinic, we'll talk again in six months. I'll let you know. Well, the VA is a different animal, right? Um, you can get access to the national level data, um, which is on the same backbone. And so I think as long as you've developed your query and refined your query, I, there are folks at the VA who are in Robert Bonomo's shop who can help you to run the same query on the national VA data, okay? So it's unfortunately not as straightforward as we would like it to be at this current moment, but I think we're on a very positive trajectory, okay? And I think the UH data for you guys in particular will be very powerful, and there will actually be financial data within the UH data that's being mapped as well. So if you have cost effectiveness questions, Sure. And drugs. I should have said drugs. Yeah, drugs. Yep. Oh, sorry, I'm just a simple statistician, so, you know. Um, yes, you would be able to. Um, yes and no. Sorry. Um, so, yes. If they were given that, you would be able to tell, one, if they were given that drug when they were in the hospital, okay? And yes, you would be able to tell, let's say, if they were seen in the outpatient setting and a prescription was written. What you don't know is whether or not they filled the prescription and took the medication, right? Now, we do have a partner who, um, as a consultant, has been helping UH map the data and they actually have access to national data systems. So they have all of the CVS national data, all of the Walgreens national data, all of the Rite Aid national data. And there may be a way to partner with them where we could incorporate that. I think that would be very powerful because the pharmacy stuff is tough, right? right. All you know is you wrote them a prescription. At your own local hospital, there eventually will be a process in place where um, you would be able to ask each of the three hospitals if they would agree to release the identifiers, okay? Because I do think that there is an interest um, from the three hospitals to try to do more joint clinical trials together, so, yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I think, I don't know, Mark, I may need your help with this one. So Mark Bino, who's the Director of Strategic Operations for the Institute, is here, and he's going to probably tell me I said all kinds of wrong stuff, hopefully not. Um, so I think in terms of the radiology notes, Anna, um, 
you know, you would have to probably use this Immerse tool, right, to help you sort of look for nodule or any other synonym of that. Um, because there's really, you know, people talk a lot about natural language processing is probably a term you guys have heard. Um, it's a very hard problem to search through notes. Um, whether or not you guys realize it or not, everybody dictates notes in their own style, and that makes it really hard to come up with a, a standardized way of searching notes for, for information. In terms of the templated stuff, I would think some of that stuff is being mapped. Um, but I don't know, like, specifically for the things that you're interested in, um, what the status is. I don't know, Mark, do you have... So, Anna, I don't know, if you have particular templates, can you email me and let me know what they are? Because then I can, we can ask the IT team about them. I, I just don't know enough about it. So. I'm sure Joe will answer more questions up here, but I want to thank, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you for having me.